We'd like to welcome you to the Julie Rose Show today. Sitting outside with Eric Smith in a beautiful setting in Rexburg, Idaho. My heart's very full today as Eric and I have been preparing for this podcast, discussing a couple ideas of what we might want to um, talk about today. And uh, as I see some of what's coming in the future for us, um, I am a bit emotional. I'm very emotional actually right now. It's been a good week here in Rexburg. Uh, it's always quite surreal for me when I come to Idaho because of uh, what I foresee as this being a city of light. With that experience comes a uh, a lot of vision for me. And so I'd ask as you listen to this podcast today that you keep in mind um, what we're going to talk about. And in all sincerity of my heart, I ask that you consider the seriousness of today's topic. Uh, Eric, just wanted to welcome you and turn the time over to you for a minute to introduce our topic. Thanks, Julie. I might just pause for a minute and just say the, the conference went really well in the tabernacle. Your remarks were really touching and powerful to me and I heard a number of other people say similar things. It was nice to meet a lot of your listeners and I just wanted to thank them for attending and being supportive and for your kind remarks um, concerning the podcasts and things. It was great to meet you guys and hope that you guys will continue to listen and share the share the word share the message share these podcasts with others the the topic is today is worship and the sabbath day i we we originally were just going to do the sabbath day but i couldn't get this idea of worship and what true worship is and um, just want to discuss a few doctrinal points and get some insights from you julie but let's start with the book of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price is, is kind of an interesting thing. This is where Moses is having a conversation with the Lord. And um, he has these experiences with Satan and with God. And he has this, these great contrasting experiences. Um, in Moses 1 verse 15, it says, Blessed be the name of my God, for his spirit hath not altogether withdrawn from me. Or else where is thy glory? For it is darkness unto me. This is where Moses is speaking to Lucifer. And I can judge between thee and God. For God said unto me, Worship God, for him only shalt thou serve. And he also gave me commandments when he called unto me out of the burning bush, saying, Call upon God in the name of mine only begotten, and worship me. So here we have the Lord giving commands to Moses to worship him and him only. There's Now if we go back to Exodus chapter 20, 3 through 6, it says, this is where the commandments were given, and I think the commandments are a good place to start with this topic as well. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So I think here we have um, the, the Lord again telling us, love me, serve me, keep my commandments. And I see these also as forms of worship. So I just want to turn it to you, Julie, and just any thoughts that you may have concerning worship. Thank you, Eric. Um, well, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, my heart's very full uh, for a number of reasons today, and in part because of this topic that I feel strongly about. So like I mentioned a few minutes ago, my heart's very full today, in part because of the topic that we're discussing today about worship. Um, I have mixed, mixed feelings, mixed emotions when it comes to this topic because I often ask myself, um, how am I on my worship, especially on Sabbath day? But it extends much, much further than that because I believe that we should worship every day. And if, if possible, 
um, almost a constant, constant state of worship to our Father in Heaven and to our Savior Jesus Christ. And I'll be the first to confess that I'm not the best at this. Um, there are times when it comes to Sabbath day worship that I find that I go to church and I'm not always in the best of spirits as I'm distracted or uh, with health issues. There are times that I'm not able to go to church or I don't feel like I can handle the energy at church because of what I experience. Um, and there are times when I go to church and I see so much pain and feel so much pain in the hearts of the people that are there that it it's a lot for me to bear uh, with the gifts that I have. And so I find it interesting that as, as we study the topic of worship and that of the Sabbath day, that I and reminded of the clear visions I've had regarding the importance of Sabbath day worship and keeping the Sabbath day holy and how that will significantly impact not only the spiritual lives of the individuals going forward in the future, but in a very real physical way, it will be a matter of life and death for those who are seeking to endure the plagues, seeking to endure, endure starvation or anything else that's going to come during the tribulations. So I feel really strongly about this topic. I um, might venture to say that I'm probably overly sensitive when it comes to keeping the Sabbath day holy. I, I have a real problem when I see people doing certain activities on the Sabbath that in my own belief system are um, contrary to what the Lord would have us do because, because I see those patterns, I see those behaviors, and then I have, um, it's like I fast forward into the future and I can see how those false traditions or false beliefs can significantly impact um, the sanctity of life. And so, anyway, I don't know if that makes any sense, but I um, I just feel really strongly about trying to express my concern about this to those who are listening, the importance of keeping the Sabbath day holy and of learning to discern what it is the Lord would have us do on the Sabbath and in preparation for the Sabbath. And I don't, I don't want to say that and sound like a hypocrite because I still have a lot of improvement in this area, but I, I do know that it's very, very important. Thanks, Julie. I want to talk about what almost like kind of define what worship is. Sometimes, some time ago, I was thinking about worship. You know, somebody said, we're going to go to our worship services. It might not even been a member of our church, but, and I was thinking, what does that mean? We go to our worship services. What, and I thought to myself, when I go to church, am I worshiping? And I got thinking about it on a practical standpoint. I was like, well, I go, I, we listen to talks, we listen to lessons, and then we go home and you know we'll we'll take the sacrament and again the sacrament is there to benefit us and so i i was thinking to myself i don't know that i'm really worshiping when i go to church it's it's everything there is designed to benefit me and um and so and then i kind of thought the same thing with regards to the temple when i go to the temple am i worshiping and I thought through that, and it's like, well, I'm going to serve the person for wh whose name I'm there officiating in behalf of, of and I, it's more of a service. And so then I just, I was just asking myself, well, what is worship? And so I, the only things I've come up with, and I'd like to hear your input, are the hymns. When we sing the hymns, this is one of the one of the best opportunities we have to worship the Father and the Savior. And I suppose in the process of taking the sacrament, we're improving ourselves and in, in which could be considered some sort of worship to the Lord because we're bettering ourselves. Um, and then the, going back to the temple, when we serve others, I think this pleases the Lord and is a form of worship. And then the prayers that take place in all those 
in meetings. In our prayers, I suppose we can say things that can be worshipful, but I, I also have a concern that sometimes we, in our prayers, we aren't, our, maybe our lips are close, our, our, our lips are close to him, but our hearts may be far from him. And so these are just some thoughts, random thoughts I've had on worship. What do you think? Um, I, I can see what you're talking about. I understand, I think, the feelings you're having. One thing that keeps coming to my mind when you said when you go to the temple you're serving or when you go to church and serving your calling, um, the impression I kept having is when we serve, we are worshiping. Mm -hmm. And that essentially we should be serving every day and they're thereby worshiping the Savior, which is different than um, forms of adoration or praises and hallelujahs, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's different forms of worship and um, and I keep thinking about thought intent. You know, what are the intentions of our heart? Because we can be doing um, something very simple with our families on any given day and it can be it can be, you know, going water skiing with your family and enjoying nature and thereby worshiping him and his and his creations if our thoughts are directed towards him so there are a lot of different forms of worship and some maybe at a higher level or degree but in everything that we do we should be worshiping him mm -hmm. i meant i mentioned a minute ago this idea of empty worship or kind of uh, maybe our hearts are absent from our services kind of like what you were just saying mm -hmm. isaiah talked about this quite a bit um, this was a real problem in the days of the israelites initially they offered their sacrifices they would go to the temple and have you know animal sacrifices and this was part of their purification process and they called them their worship services so again they're they're going to their church you know Church, right. church services, but it's like, it's the temple, this is where they offer their sacrifice, this is where they become pure and clean. They called them worship services, but really what took place was they became pure. So they be, they were the recipients, the beneficials. So, um, but but they're, they reached this point in Hebrew Israelite culture where their hearts were absent from their sacrifices. They were kind of going through the motions, I guess you could say, and so... Isaiah 29 verse 13 says wherefore the Lord said for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men Isaiah 48 verse 1 and 2 says hear ye this O house of Jacob which are called by the name of Israel and are come forth out of the waters of Judah which swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel but not in truth nor in righteousness for they call themselves of the holy city and stay themselves upon the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name. And one more scripture from Isaiah, verse chapter 1, 11 and 12. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? What those three verses are basically saying is, I know that I commanded you to perform holy ordinances, but when your heart's not in it, it's essentially a mockery before me and I don't want it. If we were to liken that to our day, it would he could easily say something like this, I'm tired of you taking the sacrament without truly repenting. I'm tired of you going to the temple and not thinking about me and going through the motions. In other words, I really want your heart in your worship. It's and amazing. I want to in interject here. Why does he want to, why does he want our heart and why does he want our worship? Every form of worship is for our benefit. He doesn't need it. He doesn't do it for his own aggrandizement. He, um, he wants our heart and he wants our worship because it's what makes us whole. It's what makes us purified. It's what brings us home. And as we are endeared to him through our worship, we become lighter. We become more um, loving. We become more 
Christ-like in our attributes, thereby becoming individuals that can attain um, greater de degrees of light and knowledge and thereby increase in powers and priesthoods and other um, other gifts. And so, I, you know, it's an interesting point you've made, Eric, because you, were, you kind of outlined all these things that we do in the name of worship, but they're really for our benefit. And that is how I see worship. Everything we do, we should do in the name of Christ, and we should act on on his behalf in a wholesome manner, but it's not for him, it's for us. Yeah, well said. Well, and for the Israelites, it led to their demise. It led to their scattering. And this was a big topic to Isaiah. It broke his heart. It broke a lot of the hearts of prophets before and after Isaiah, the scattering of Israel. And it seems that this scattering really was the punishment for them breaking their covenants and for their lack of heart and their worship to God. And I, I believe it would, wouldn't be a stretch to say that we're repeating Israel's behavior in ancient right. days. I agree. And I, and I think that this, this is serious enough that it, worth mentioning that if, that if our hearts are absent in our worship, we face the same sort of scattering or, or destruction to an extent. And there's a, there's a powerful quote that I read by Elder Maxwell, um, Neil A. Maxwell, a number of years ago, who in talking about the second coming of the Savior, he, he said this, And if you sense that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, why not do so now? For in the coming of that collective confession, it will mean much less to kneel down when it is no longer possible to stand up. I like this because it's, he's, he's saying you have a choice in how you worship the Father, the Lord. You can kneel down in humility right now, or he'll cause you to do it. Isaiah and a number of other prophets talked about this idea of things that are high shall be brought low in the last days. Micah 1, 3 says, For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. This is, I've learned this is a physical and a spiritual thing whenever prophets talk about this. Luke 14, 11, Luke 18, 14, Matthew 23, 12, DNC 101, 42, all say, for whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. This going back to this quote by Elder Maxwell, if we if we exalt ourselves, our worship is empty, and the Lord will abase us, humble us. If we humble ourselves, our worship will be full and true, and the Lord will protect us. I appreciate that. That makes me think of one of the speakers on Saturday who talked about um, many of us being at the 90 or I, I forget the exact verb which he used 90 99 percent committed to Christ but that we need to be a hundred percent committed to, to Christ and to the cause and how many of us are a hundred percent committed I know I'm still working on that but there are areas of my life that I'm still needing to commit to Christ um, and and I think that falls in line with this Sabbath day worship or wor with worship in general how many of us have truly converted to Christ? How many of us have truly given our lives to Christ? How many of us are willing to give all for the cause of Christ? I'd venture to say that every one of us has need to repent and need to focus on, on um, reconvening our efforts or bringing together our hearts in unity for Christ and basically putting off the world, putting off Babylon, and coming to him in humility and in repentant heart and saying to the Lord that we'll do everything we can to become like him so that we can fulfill his purposes, which is to redeem mankind, to um, build one another and to gather the family home, whether we're on this side of the veil or the other side of the veil, making sure that we do all in our power to follow his example to be the best that we can be and to put off um, the adversarial um, influences that are all around us. Well said. Thanks, Julie. I want to mention one more 
uh, idea bullet point here before we move on and shift gears to the Sabbath day a little bit. Um, and this is just from my own experience in worship. I, it occurred to me a number of years ago that um, there that I could find a more powerful form of worship by through my prayers. And um, there was a scripture in Isaiah that talked. Uh, it's a, it's in you know we hear it a lot at Christmas in the Hallelujah chorus, and it's wonderful. Counselor, Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I remembered hearing this scripture and thinking of these great words Isaiah used to describe the, the Savior. And I, and I started to realize that the words that we use in addressing our Maker and our Savior um, can, can really enhance the, the form of worship. Think of the Hallelujah Chorus and you know shouting hallelujah hallelujah and and that's a form of worship and so so this idea that the words we use in our prayer can draw power in and in connecting our hearts to heavenly fathers and let him fill that worshipful expression of our hearts and then i started to think well i'm gonna I'm going to, in my prayers, I'm going to refer to him using words that are respectful and worshipful. And I'm, I'm going to tell him what I love about him. And so, in other words, I was, I was complimenting him in my prayers. I would say things like, Father, thou art so wonderful. Thou, and, and it wasn't just lip service. I really meant them and felt them. Father, thou art glorious, thou art intelligent and om omniscient and all-knowing. And I would think about cases in my life where I felt he was all-knowing and where he had perfectly orchestrated the events of my day and blessed me. And, and I would say thanks from the deepest parts of my heart. So I wanted to throw this out as some suggestions in your prayer and in your worship. Compliment Heavenly Father. Let Him know what you love about Him and what you're grateful for to Him and what He does for you. I also, going back to Isaiah and some of these other prophets who talked about high things being made low and humbling ourselves and abasing ourselves. This is physical and spiritual, and I, I wanted to throw this out as a suggestion. And speaking from experience, I believe this has affected and improved my worship. In the days of the Israelites, there was a phrase they used of praying prostrate, and this means to to get low in your in your prayer in your kneeling position. So if you can imagine someone kneeling upright, you can take that kneel and go a little lower, you know, and tuck your your bottom down there behind by your ankles, and that's a little lower. And then as you fill in your heart more humility, more gratitude, more sense of desire to worship the Father there's this tendency to want to, to lean forward and bow before him. And you're getting lower still in your worship. And for those who want to take it even a step further, you can, you can actually lay almost face down right on the floor. This is laying prostrate. And it, it's not so much that your physical position matters I mean I but it enhances what the feelings of your heart and so if you're feeling humble and and beckoning the Lord to help and bless you you can get lower and lower in your position before him and I just want to challenge people to try this and just see if it affects and enhances your worship of Heavenly Father I think that's beautiful Eric I know there have been many times in my life that just naturally, as I've struggled with health challenges, relationship challenges, um, employment issues, or other financial concerns, as I've cried out to the Lord in worship and in in begging Him for relief from the pain, um, I have naturally done this. And I think it's astounding that you would be talking about that right now because um, I have clear memory of some circumstances in my life where I was so uh, desperate for healing that it was an automatic response for me to get on the floor um, and, and beg for that relief. And, and then when the relief came, to get on the floor again and thank him. So thank you for bringing that mm -hmm. up. Yeah, thanks for sharing that.
I've heard some of your other stories of you just pleading to the Lord in desperation, and um, it's it's really powerful and touching. I found that that He, the, our Father in heaven, has a tendency to match the intensity of our hearts, and so I I want to bear my witness that the more intense and and plead pleading full our prayers are to the Father, that He responds in kind. And he loves us, and I know that he wants to bless us and help us and answer the desires of our prayers. In Exodus 20, 1 through 17, we're given some commandments here concerning the Sabbath. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But that's not all he says about the Sabbath. Sometimes we leave it right there. He says, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do... Shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So how can we, Julie, how can we liken those commandments? You know, he's talking about your servants shouldn't work, your your animals shouldn't work or your visitors your guests you know these kinds right. of things well i think we we have some traditions that some of us have this is just my personal belief you know having these big big ornate meals on sunday or or um gatherings and other things and i think i think we just need to focus on the family we need to focus on simplicity on the sabbath we need to focus on doing those things which uplift and edify and and like it says it's very clear don't do work um there are some things that we have to do to be able to just maintain um, the basics to get through the day but i think where where we're able to to prepare things on on a saturday for sunday and then on monday take care of what wasn't done on sunday i i've seen a real difference in my life when i do that more effectively um, this automatically makes me think of some of the visions I've had and some of what I was shown in my NDE and that, and that has to do with as we go forward in the tribulations and I've seen in a very real way that the Lord at, at some point will send manna. Now it will come in the form similar to that of the Israelites and in a more extreme case but it will also come from messengers, um, from visitors and um, in some cases cupboards that will be replenished and the Lord has made it very clear to me that I am to witness and testify of the principle of keeping the Sabbath day holy. So what I've seen in regard to this is um, like I mentioned just like in the days of the Israelites when Christ sent manna, God sent manna to the to the people um, I have seen that the commandment will be for individuals who are in the camps to collect what they need to on Saturday in preparation for the Sabbath. Those that follow this guideline will be blessed and they will have enough to get them through for the next day or two to survive. Those that do not, a curse will come upon the, the people and in many cases upon that entire camp and they will end up dying or they will end up getting sick from the food that's been given them that they did not take proper stewardship over and follow the commandments on keeping the Sabbath day holy. And I want to emphasize this. This is real, you guys. I know this to be true. And I hope that when you get in that circumstance, if you are in that circumstance, you will, in all seriousness, consider the, the importance of keeping the Sabbath day holy. This goes the same as far as chopping firewood, preparing things in the camp setting, or elsewhere, if you're not in a camp and you're in a home, the same guidelines, the same laws apply. Doing everything we can to prepare on this on the Saturday before the Sabbath, I have seen the difference between those that have priesthood protection in camps and those that do not. Those that would like to have priesthood protection need to keep the Sabbath day holy. And this is an example of when also loves the lamb's blood was put above the the doors to protect them from the plague that came through um, when Pharaoh's uh, child was killed and the firstborn child was killed 
many similarities. Study in the book of, of Revelations about this. Study in the Bible regarding the story of Moses and the Israelites as they escaped from Egypt. Study those stories in the scriptures. I cannot emphasize enough that it will be repeated in our day. The very things that the Israelites went through when Moses was working, trying to rescue his people, and then when he pulled them out and they escaped from Egypt. Look at those patterns in the scriptures and see how it applies to your life and how it will apply in the coming days. I like that, Julie. I want to read one of those scriptures that you're referring to. Um, this comes from Numbers 15, 32 through 36. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto the congregation. And they put him in, in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. So here we have a man who broke the Sabbath and was killed for it, and the Lord commanded it. And all those members of the congregation were the ones who did it. Do you see, do you see, punish, I mean, this is kind of a harsh punishment. Do you, do you think this is harsh? Do you think, do you see this sort of harsh penalty? I have been shown that there will be very strict rules as, as a matter of life and death, because curses will come upon the people and they will not have priesthood protection that's needed. And I mean, even for something as simple as gathering firewood on the Sabbath, there's a reason that story is in the scriptures. One of the, sh the scenes that I was shown is a man gathering firewood and trying to get other people to do it. And they, they who gathered the firewood were cast out of the camp because without that ability to have um, the people living a higher law, they, they would lose their priesthood protection to keep them from having foreign troops penetrate the camps or marauders or plagues or other things. And so pestilence and things like that. It very much will become a matter of life and death for many people. And in that case, I, you know, I didn't see anyone getting shot and killed by anybody in the camp or anything like that. But I did see them force people to leave that had not kept the Sabbath day holy. Very interesting. Which is essentially a death sentence. Right. It is a death sentence. If you're if you're not in that place of refuge, that is a death sentence. Well, it it seems in the in the days of Moses, the Israelites, like the Ten Commandments, were the law of the land. It was a, it was a church state, and um, and so if you. <laughs> If you sin, you're breaking the law of the land as well. And so it's, right. it's, it's kind of like this idea. I like to think of this breaking the Sabbath day or committing adultery or things like this today. We don't really punish them civic, civilly. but um, right. Well, if you commit adultery in the camps, I guarantee you there's a law against that. Same with anything else that has to do with on a, on a moral level, um, varying degrees there. But if you're in the camps, and people don't want to hear this, but in the camps I have seen, People will commit adultery. People will mess. There will be those that try to molest children. There will be very inappropriate things that will occur, and punishment will ensue for those individuals. It would have to, you know, to, to the protection that's so desperately needed. Um, it's like the, the the weak link in the chain, right? If right. one link is broken, it puts the rest of everybody at risk. One scene that they showed me was a. Uh, well, two. One was a couple that had had an adultery, adulterous relationship, and both the man and the woman were kicked out of the camp, and they were left with the decision of do we take, do we make their whole family leave, or just the individuals? And then it was a heartbreaking scenario because the mother was left to she had to leave her children, and the the man had to leave his wife and children. And it, you know, it was devastating. Mm. Another example I saw was of a man who had molested a little girl while in the camp, and he was extricated. He had to leave, and they the group got together that was in that family of ten. Uh, the the captain of ten got together. They had a discussion, and um, it was decided upon that the man would need to leave the camp, and he essentially had to abandon six children and a wife. Wow. Wow, thanks for that witness. Right. And he and he tried to force his wife and children to come with him, and those in the camps had to intervene on her behalf and on the behalf of the children to, to rescue them and keep them from being 
further abused by this man. Mm. So it yeah. sounds a little harsh on our ears today, but uh, the consequences are so real. They are real. I'm thinking of another scripture, James 2.10 says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So these are, this is the reality of the, the situation in the future. Obedience, strict obedience is going to be crucial. can't stress enough the, the importance of obedience. Obedience is key. Obedience is key, and I hope you guys will remember that when you're in the camps or wherever you are, if you're living in your home and you have people that come to you for a place of refuge, obedience is key. If you are obedient to the Lord's commandments, that's the first line of defense against adversarial attacks, demons, uh, unclean spirits on a spiritual level and on a, on a physical level. It's your best line of defense to be able to be in tune to know what you need to do to protect your family. I have a final thought here, Julie, and then I'll give you the last word. Um, Julie and I have been talking about how the words we use with people can create what she often calls a heart connection. So you can try this. For those who are married, there are certain words you can say to your spouse that will create an instant connection and you'll feel the affection and deepness of your love for your spouse. Um, you know, it just just imagine a busy day at work. You come home, busy day, and you know, your wife has been stressing out or your husband had a bad day at work or whatever. And you don't, you're not really connected in that moment, but if you just take the time, look them in the eye, and say, hello, sweetheart. That's all it can take to create an instant heart connection is you lock eyes and your hearts connect and you feel love and affection for each other. I... I believe in the power of our words to create such connections. And I bring this up as an example of a heart connection that I think is important in establishing with our Heavenly Father in, as we worship and as we try to live the Sabbath day. And um, it occurred to me that maybe I ought to try finding my key word that I can use with Heavenly Father in my prayer that will let him know that I, I earnestly want to connect with his heart and let him know that I love him. And so I, I encourage everybody to think, find your word. And, and I'll just share with you, my word is really simple. It's Father. As I just address him simply by using that one word, Father, as long as the intensity of my heart is there, it does create that heart connection. And I, I feel a literal bond connection with him, just as, he's, as if he's sitting right there listening to me. And I felt his eagerness to answer my prayers in those cases where I really try to connect with his heart. I appreciate that, Eric. Um, I address him in the same manner, and I find that most often when I'm trying to connect with him instantaneously, I will simply call to him and say, Father, I love you. Father, I love you. Father, I love you. And um, so mine's a key phrase. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, That's great. And I have other key phrases, but that is the one I, I use the most um, because I do love him. So. And you feel that connection as you use I do, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And it's a different relationship. It goes from me. It's It's... I think of it in a very real sense. If if I were to think of my mortal father, well, when I haven't seen my mortal father for a while or I haven't talked to him for a while, then I say that to my to my dad too. Dad, I love you. And it's the same thing with Heavenly Father. You know, Dad, I love you. Mm -hmm. And it's it's instantaneous. Well, Julie, that's all I have on this topic. I just bear my witness that a real strong heart connection and a real eager desire to serve our Father in Heaven, to worship Him, to love Him, and serve our fellow man, and to live the Sabbath day holy are keys in delivering us in the future. Thank you. I appreciate that today. It's a good topic. I, I, I don't say this to cause fear. I don't say this to try in any way to manipulate people in into to doing things of a lesser law and keeping the Sabbath day holy. I say this in all sincerity of my heart, you guys. Keeping the Sabbath day holy is key because obedience is key and it is one of the top ten commandments, the basic 
celestial law. We're not even talking celestial or terrestrial here. We're talking basics to survive in a celestial world. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of us keeping the basic Ten Commandments. And I say that in Christ's name.